Yes, I was um, wondering whether we should always hold on to this moral ideal of speaking the truth. And I want to give a personal example here. A uh, week before I came, um, I was home again. I usually live uh, away from home because I study. And I uh, had the opportunity to spend time with my mother again. And she was really uh, reaching out for me, asking, uh, yeah, should I, should I stay here? Do you want to talk? Do, do you want to do something? And we usually, in, in all our life, never really had this relationship. So I, I, um, yeah, I, I told her, but uh, mom, what should we do? She didn't know an answer. What should we talk about? She didn't know an answer. And then I tried to uh, give her this, and this understanding that, um, yeah, so we just, uh, it's very hard for us to talk. I, I was trying to put it smoothly. It's hard for us to talk because we don't have much in, in common and and I told her that it was always like this. We never did something together and we never really talked together and this, I really, she, uh, she had water in her eyes. It made her really sad and I'm wondering whether I should c continue this conversation because it's, I feel sometimes the truth causes more suffering than there is benefit of that because uh, I am okay with this, I am at, at peace, I, I can understand that she was a young mother with uh, three children and, the, and now things are like they are and this is fine and, and when I just, I don't have the need to express it, I think my, me telling the truth will only cause harm in her because I see that she suffers so much and somehow she doesn't learn from the suffering, she does not reflect and ask why is it this way, she doesn't understand understand and then similar when I would when these conversations would come up she if I would tell her the truth and then she could ask uh, well do you think I was a good mother or something and I would I would have to say um, no I don't think you're a good mother or I don't love you at least right now and then that would I think really be so hurtful to hear from your own son that yeah that hearing that Dear friend, thank you for the question. Are the translators okay with understanding the question? It's okay. I think there are different levels of truth. And there are different ways to practice loving speech. You have had enough good conditions to come here to enjoy the practice, to seek to understand yourself and those people in your life. So your mother was a successful mother. <laughs> we may not know what love is, we may not be able to recognize it in the different forms that it comes to us. You are healthy, you have an education. These are all sources of the energy of love that have come to you since the moment you were born, since the moment you were in your mother's womb. So your mother has been loving you for a long time. She's been nurturing you. So with the eyes of deep looking, uh, we train ourselves to see the energy of love and the ways it comes to us. To learn how to love and how to put our love into words, that is a lifetime of practice. Some of us find it easier to express our love in action than in words. Some of us find it very hard to say, I love you, 
whether it's to our child or even to our partner or even to our brothers and sister. We can always ask ourselves a question in our relationships. Uh, how can I nurture well-being in this relationship? So maybe instead of saying to our mum, we have never understood each other and we have nothing in common. <laughs> that is not the practice of loving speech and that is not um, very helpful. That may cause more separation. But we can instead ask the question, Mum, do I understand you enough? We can ask that of our partners, of our siblings. Do I understand you enough? What is important to you in your life? And we can also ask them, what is your deepest dream? Our teacher, this come, these questions come from our teacher and he said we have to know the kind of questions to ask to open up true communication with the close people in our life. Mum, what are the dreams you had for your life that you have not yet been able to realize and how can I help you realize them? Or what would you wish for me that I could do in my life to continue what has not been possible in your own life? So these are all skillful ways to communicate in a way that can nurture the relationship. And sometimes the most loving speech is silence. We sit and we breathe and we offer our presence to the other person because we cannot yet formulate the kind of words that would be uh, helpful <laughs> and not destructive. So we breathe and we smile and we wait until we have a more mature or ripened understanding so we know uh, what to say and what not to say. Good luck. Um, dear Thai, dear Zanga, um, I have a chronic kidney disease since I was born and when I'm in pain and the uh, disease shows up, my mind tells me that I don't deserve to, li to live. So how can I deal with my pain and my disease in a more loving way?
So thank you for this very important question. <laughs> mm. I feel a lot of love in the room right now. <laughs> and I feel that uh, just coming up here to sit here and ask that question, to water the seed of love in everybody in the room is already, uh, <laughs> is already reason enough. <laughs> to want to live. Everyone, um, every one of us has pain, <laughs> and uh, for some of us it's uh, something very minor, and it goes away. <laughs> and I think, uh, but for some of us it's, uh, like in your case, it's something that is every day. <laughs> Not every day. But <laughs> yeah. And when I, in my practice, when I am dealing with pain, like lately, it's pretty minor, but I have pain in my back for the past few weeks. And sometimes even just to stand in a place, just for a few minutes, I'm in so much pain I have to sit down. And I don't know why, where it came from. <laughs> I didn't have that pain before. You can follow our breathing with the sound of the telephone. So I see um, my habit from the past is to, to get angry at the pain and say, why, why, why is it me? Why do I have that pain? It's not fair. <laughs> but somehow that's not very helpful when I have that thinking. So instead of uh, having that thought, it's not fair, instead I try to see the pain just as it is not to add my thinking to it, to really go in, into the pain, not to make it stronger or less, but just to understand the pain. So I use my mindfulness to, to shine light on the pain, to understand it. Not because I want to transform it, not because I want to, uh, not because it's a problem that I want to go away, but just to understand it. Is my body telling me something? Is there some form of communication that I haven't been listening to? I haven't been able to receive? That's uh, how I establish a relationship with pain in my body with sickness or illness. I see it as a way for my, my leg, my back, my nerves to communicate to me something... Actually, I don't even try to say what it is. <laughs> to say that it's wrong or that it's right, but just to pay attention to it. And what I notice is that it's always changing. It never stays the same. <laughs> sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's less. I have a, a tinnitus, you know, so I always have a ringing in my ear. When I was young, I liked to play in a rock band. <laughs> and uh, I was right next to the drum a lot. <laughs> and so uh, my, my desire to want to 
to play in the band had an effect. <laughs> and sometimes when I started, when I was in my late 20s and it started to manifest, all I wanted to do was make it go away <laughs> so that I could walk into the forest and enjoy the silence. But uh, sometimes it was worse, sometimes it was less. And uh, when I got over my attempt to just make it go away, to try to find a cure, to, to, you know, I just uh, I learned to accept it and allow it to be part of my experience of life and see what I can learn from it. Because uh, I found that uh, pain is a great teacher. If we allow it, if we allow it in, we allow it to, um, like 100%, be part of who we are. Also, I remember when I was young, I used to, I used to love to run. I was, uh, and I started to run competitively at university. I was, and. But I trained so hard that eventually I had problems with my knee. And I suffered so much. <laughs> For a year I tried to, I had surgery, I tried every way to try to get back to my love, which was to run through the forest every day. And that, uh, that pain, that injury, became a great teacher for me. Suddenly I realized that suffering is part of life. <laughs> and that, uh, and now as a monk I can sit here and say that, that that pain in my knee is part of the reason I'm sitting here as a monk. <laughs> because I, I was able to get past just trying to push it away. But to see that I was learning, I was getting wisdom, getting insight from this experience of pain. And that insight was helping me, but not only me. It also helped my family. My parents were going through a divorce. It helped me to have compassion towards both my mother and my father, not to take one side. So pain is a great teacher. When we understand our pain more deeply than when we see somebody who is very angry, instead of... Uh, just rejecting them, saying, I don't want anything to do with that person. We see somebody who's suffering, who needs help. Because we know, we ourselves, when we have pain, we are also angry. We are also sad. And so we, we learn to turn our pain, our suffering, into a source of insight that can help us to get in touch with the good conditions that are still there. Like, at, you can still walk. <laughs> Many people, they still, they don't, they, they would give anything just to have one day that they could walk on the earth in mindfulness. You can still breathe. <laughs> Before I became a monk, I, I was kind of like a nurse for a year, taking care of a man with muscular dystrophy. And uh, he could not uh, breathe on his own. It was a great uh, teaching for a monk, somebody who is uh, practicing mindfulness of breathing every day. <laughs> to be with somebody who could only breathe with a, the help of a machine. And so I would practice uh, breathing meditation next to him. And I'd hear the sound of the machine pushing air into his lungs through a hole in his throat. And uh, when I would get off of work every day, I would walk across Boston maybe 45 minutes. Most people would take the subway and the bus, but I enjoyed walking and breathing. <laughs> I really didn't need much effort to touch the gratitude that I still can walk and I can still breathe on my own. Because being with Alan, I knew he could not walk, he could not breathe on his own. Just to get from work to his apartment, he had to arrange a transport maybe one month in advance, every day. <laughs> So we have pain, and maybe that pain stays with us a long time. 
but it is not all of who we are. <laughs> there are many other good conditions that are still there. And if we know how to recognize them, that can be a source of joy <laughs> in the moments when the pain seems like it's overwhelming. And there's a, a practice we do here in Plum Village, which is, not, which is a, called the second arrow. <laughs> the practice of not the, letting the second arrow uh, overwhelm us. The Buddha told a story about a man who is uh, wounded by an arrow. And uh, and the the doctor removed the arrow, but when the arrow when that man is stuck struck a second time in the same place by an arrow, he, the pain is ten times worse. And so the Buddha said that second arrow is our mind. So our thinking is the source of most of our suffering. <laughs> we have pain. But the thinking that comes with it, the questioning, like the question you ask, why do I deserve to be alive? That is the second arrow. <laughs> so in mindfulness practice, we learn how to stop that kind of thinking. Come back to our breathing, come back to our body, and get in touch with what is really going on. We say truth is found in life. It's not in our thinking. <laughs> So the actual raw experience of the pain, see if you can just be with that in mindfulness and not give rise to any kind of thinking. Just embrace it like it's a baby crying out for your attention so you can learn from it. And I can't tell you what that learning will be. That's the uniqueness of your experience that you have to share with the world. And I think it's extraordinarily important to share it with the world. Thank you for your practice. Is it okay if we take one question from the written yes. questions and then we have your question? No, no, please, you can, you can sit. You can sit. Yeah. So there are a few questions which are a little bit similar. Maybe I put them together. So one is, how can I let go of my attachments? One, to being accepted by others. Two, to quote, having this person. And three, to using the internet. <laughs> and an another question about attachment. I have children who are growing up. I see them ready to leave the home and take their own path in life. And I'm very happy and, and uh, grateful. Still, when they find difficulties, I feel that I suffer with them. And I feel that my suffering doesn't help them at all. I believe, I also believe that I'm attached to them and their past as a child. And that's not what I want. How can I detach myself from them? Or how, how can I practice detachment? How can I love them without being attached? And there's one more question. What is freedom?
Um, it seems our society values detachment so much. I don't know if any of you here are seeking for detachment. Can you raise your hand? Are you here to find detachment? Huh? Okay. I think the more I practice, I'm going in the opposite direction. <laughs> uh, opposite direction as uh, detachment. Mm. I'm not sure if we are, so, we are in our society, we are still so influenced by uh, Stoics, the Stoics, uh, uh, the, by Stoic philosophy, in that, uh, you know, you have to be able to, if something happens, you have to be able to kind of handle all the difficulties that happen, you have to be free, you have to be solid, you have to be stable, you... It's a kind of a, a, a certain model of a human being who is um, strong, healthy, able to handle all difficulties. Uh, and I think many of us, we are seeking, in a way. Being here, maybe uh, one of the undercurrents of your uh, desire to be in Plum Village is this seeking to be this person, uh, strong, capable of handling your suffering, uh, capable of generating joy and happiness. So in a way, when we are looking for the practice here, although on the surface we say, Oh, I'm here to learn how to understand and accept myself. The other part of it, and it could be a bit of a danger, is that I want perfection. So we have to kind of recognize, um, recognize that kind of desire uh, that's behind. Even though on the surface you go, I just want to learn how to accept myself. And then in moments when you're not able to accept yourself, so much judgments come up. And that's the side of you that is seeking for perfection. So we have to learn how to recognize these energies and uh, the energies that kind of push us and motivate us. Um, and recently I have been um, in recent years, I have been learning how to recognize uh, the limits of my understanding. Um, and there are symptoms to help me recognize the limits of my understanding. Uh, for instance, when I'm suffering, when I'm angry or, uh, you know, frustrated or whatever. Or if I say, okay, I'm okay with this situation, but actually I'm not really okay. <laughs> uh, those are all symptoms where I say, oh, I've reached the limits of my understanding. Um, because I've reached the limits of my understanding, and that's why I'm feeling like this, whether I'm reacting in a, I'm feeling anger or frustration or just lack of uh, maybe love or understanding. Yeah, I've reached the limits of my understanding. When the young man earlier came up to ask the question about his mother, and he said, you know, oh, I can accept this situation, I'm fine with it. I, I saw myself in him and I said, oh, he's reached the limits of his understanding. <laughs> So sometimes when you've reached this limit, you either go, okay, I'm fine with this. And then you kind of uh, find a way to be fine with it. It's what they call, um, I think there are terms for it out there, they say spiritual bypassing. <laughs> it's a form of spiritual bypassing. <laughs> and uh, so either you go that way and you're okay, I'm fine with it. or you know, you really experience the anger or the frustration that goes along with um, having reached the limits of our understanding. 
Um, and so, for my practice, when I have, uh, it's quite nice to be angry, and I just go, oh, I reached the limits of my en- understanding. So rather than fuming over my anger, uh, I take this other path of kind of uh, uh, embracing my anger, looking deeply into it, and really trying to understand why, why I'm angry, why am I frustrated, why am I feeling. Uh, so sad that my children are suffering. Why am I... uh, uh, Yeah, why? And so then you begin to answer. uh, You begin to answer these questions about your situation and then you have an insight um, to help you to understand and for me, that understanding has to lead to love. I notice that uh, for myself, when I'm in a situation and I haven't gotten to the point where I can either uh, really understand, and the understanding serves to, uh, for me to be able to love myself or for me to be able to love the other person, I'm still caught my understanding is still limited. So these are just some of the symptoms. Um, Like I'm trying to share with you how I take my own pulse, (laughs) Uh, how I uh, kind of like uh, measure my own uh, mind or or where I'm at at the moment, and then how I move forward with the the practice. And um, I find that um, many of our, uh, many of my um, uh, reactions uh, to things, or the way I, the way I think, the way I react to things, it's very much conditioned, and. Um, And so when I get to this point where I say, oh, I've reached the limit of my understanding, uh, and I look into the situation, I al- almost always recognize how I've been conditioned to react like that or mm, to think like that. Um, and then I can always find a different way uh, to uh, react. For instance, when the young man said, um, you know, oh, I, this, is, this relationship is, how can we move forward with this relationship? It seems so awkward. Um, that awkwardness that you feel is also a form of conditioning. Mm, and so how to, uh, how to get around it, how to overcome it, we need practice. Uh, not to just give up right there, but we need to, we need a bit of training, we need practice. Um, and it's the same with um, having to, when you are with your children who are grown and they are suffering, our reaction to our children's suffering is also a bit conditioned. Uh, and that is because when we touch our children's suffering, it touches the kind of suffering in us but we have not learned how to handle, to, we haven't learned how to be with suffering. That's why when our children suffer, then we suffer. And that uh, kind of uh, adds to our children's suffering. Um, so learning how to see the ways in which we are responding to things in a very conditioned uh, way, and really coming back to recognize where is this coming from. Uh, where am I limited in this way of being? Um, so how to come back to ourselves and to uh, handle the suffering that comes up? Um, and the question that, uh, yeah, how can I, how can I uh, be with the, my children's suffering? How can I be there for them when I also suffer, when I see them suffer? Uh, 
So the first thing we have to do is to learn how to handle that suffering when it comes up in, in, within ourselves. And this last week we have learned um, many different ways to come back home, uh, to just be with the suffering, whether it's through our breathing, through our sitting meditation, taking our walk, uh, suffering for a walk. And in my experience, it will, the suffering will continue to be there until I've reached some kind of understanding uh, about it that will lead me to either love or acceptance uh, of myself or the other person. So sometimes, for me now, when my suffering just is there and it repeats itself, I go, just as a different way of relating to the suffering that's present, I don't push it away, I, I say, oh, this is my way. This is my mind's way of trying to figure out an answer. I don't know if you, you see this? Sometimes you want the suffer, a suffering comes up and you want it to go away right away. Or sometimes like, it keeps getting triggered within you and you don't get what, you don't understand why. It's because we haven't learned a way out of it. So it's the same with like a math problem. If once you've figured out a math problem, you know, and you know the solution, you know how to get from the problem to the solution, you never have to figure it out again, right? And I feel it's very much the same way as figuring out how to be with our suffering, uh, how to be with the pain. When, and it keeps coming up again and again, sometimes the same kind of suffering, sometimes the same kind of pain. It's simply our way. Uh, I think it's very natural. Um, simply the mind's way, the body's way of saying, look, this is here and we haven't handled it yet. We really haven't learned how to handle it yet. How to handle it yet. Um, we haven't produced the lotus from this mud yet. And even if we've produced the lotus, the lotus becomes mud again, and that's okay. Um, so learning um, to reach the limits of our understanding, uh, learning what that means. Um, when there's suffering there, we've reached our, the limits of our understanding. And how to be with that suffering, how to be with that pain. Um, we have to kind of have a, uh, as practitioners, uh, as a novice, I was taught early that uh, you have to kind of develop an attitude, a relationship, a good attitude towards our suffering or our difficulties. And once you have this attitude, uh, this relationship, it will help you to move, advance a bit quicker, uh, advance or, you know, look deeply into your suffering. So for myself, my attitude for my suffering is simply learning that it's, I'm limited right now, and how can I get past this limit? And also the suffering is there because I haven't figured out and it's okay for it, continue, for it to continue to be there. It's just an opportunity for me to figure out. Yeah? Uh, I hope it's clear. <laughs> Thank you. So, dear Thai, dear Sangha, my question is about um, how to handle my cravings. Um, 
I suffered from an eating disorder in the past and it's still in me, so I have a lot of cravings for food and thinking about food a lot still. Um, but, um, but I mean cravings for activities, sex, um, consuming in general. Um, I see that it can cause a lot of suffering for myself, for other beings on the planet when I um, follow my cravings and satisfy my cravings, but sometimes I just can't see any suffering, so I only see the pleasure and I don't understand why I should hold myself back then. Um, so in the sutra it says that as long as you follow your cravings, you can't get enlightened, so yeah, my question is um, why and how do you hold yourself back from your cravings, desires and pleasure and um, without the feeling of holding yourself back but um, be happy instead? Hi, dear community, dear friend. Um, I have the feeling that craving is a, is a is a superficial form of something else. You know, craving manifests because there is something else inside that is pushing us to go in one direction. Um, and that is why craving is different from desire, right? If you don't eat for a week, then you feel hungry. And that's not craving, that is just a healthy desire for food. But then there is also a mechanism inside of our mind that will go, will start spinning and going off and it will tell you like, you want to eat all the time. Or you're craving for something all the time. And that's when, uh, when you know that there is, <laughs> there is a basic principle inside that is pushing you toward that direction. The craving is not there by itself, but the craving has many conditions. And you need to begin to understand yourself a little bit better. You need to know why that craving is there. So the craving itself is not the real problem. And if you engage the craving directly, you'll become very tired. Because you'll start this inner battle with yourself, in which there is a side of you that is saying, No, this is not good. I should not do this the kind of moral self. It's like, you know what's right and what's wrong, right? And then there is another part of you that says, but this feels pretty good, why should I not do it? And then you'll be stuck. Oh, too fast, huh? Let's see. I was taking my revenge on Huichuk. Because <laughs> he's saying, no, you go, you go after. <laughs> I do it by myself. Um... <laughs> <clears throat> And so, um, I think it is very important to, to embark ourselves in a journey to discover what's inside. Why do you have that craving and, and what, what is it communicating to you? So take the craving as a messenger of something else. There is a deeper layer of suffering, of void, of emptiness sometimes that you need to fill up. And once you discover that suffering and how deep it can feel also, how big it can it be. I think you'll forgive some of that craving and you'll be able to accept yourself a little bit more. And I feel that is the first step toward beginning to transform. You know, you reconcile with the fact that the craving has a reason. It's not because you're bad. You're not bad about having craving or, or anything like that. That's just fine. It's just very human. So you start begin to understand yourself begin to accept yourself a little bit more and then it becomes a little bit easier to um, deal with your mind because you're starting to develop a sort of friendship with yourself you're not engaging your craving in battle but you're beginning to become friend with it and to understand that your craving is a wounded child and sometimes when he wants an ice cream it will do all it can to get the ice cream <laughs> right 
<laughs> and, and it will be very hard for you. So you need to learn how to embrace the child and how to teach the child the ice cream is not good for you now. You don't need an ice cream. You know? So you have to help that side of you that became, that, that's, that, that still is a little child crying. You, know? you have to embrace him and you have to teach him you know, how to become an adult. And there's a part of you, there's an adult, there's, you know, an older person that can do that. You can teach the child because you have experience in life. And, and you, you can tell why craving is not good for you. You experience how that can really damage your mind and damage your emotions and bring you to a very unpleasant state of being. And, and so, that is, that is one aspect of it. And also, you know, one thing that, that really helps me and that I do very often is to connect things. Uh, I have the feeling, you know, that there's this part of me, okay, um, you want to eat a lot, you know, there's good food on the table, and then you go crazy on it. And then afterwards, of course, you'll feel sick. But it's very important for me when I feel sick to make a mental note, oh, I am sick because I ate too much and I, I was craving too much. It's just a mental note, I'm not fighting, I'm just recognizing, simple recognition of the fact that this is because that is. And slowly your mind will begin to create that connection. That connection is not there yet. When the craving is there, you cannot still see a very strong connection on how that craving is going to make you suffer. Maybe you can think about it, but it still remains at a level of thought. You cannot really believe that. Because, because the craving is there, it's taking over your mind. But the more you do that, the more that connection will become strong. So something happens, you recognize, oh, this pain, this negative emotion is because the way I use my body, or because of the way I, I, I overate, or I didn't eat enough, or whatever. Just recognizing, where is this coming from? And I think that is also a beginning of, of a, you know, of a path of recognizing where things come from, of recognizing them for what they are. You know, we, we are used to, uh, to see uh, food or sex or, or fame or money or whatever as a thing by itself. But actually, if you get that thing, there is many other things that go with it. It's not just one thing. It's an ecosystem of things that you're bringing upon yourself. So, once you recognize that and you have a lived experience, a physical and emotional experience of how that makes you suffer, then your body naturally rejects it. Because if you can feel it in the body, the suffering, your body will say, no, I, I don't want this. But if you can only think about it, if it still remains at a level of thought of like, oh, I shouldn't do this because it's not good, that's not strong enough. Your body will make you do that. Your mind will bring you in that direction anyways. And the Im image the Buddha gives us is a man, a weak man that is being dragged by two strong men. You know, it's like you cannot resist that. It's way stronger than you. So you really need to fully experience the suffering. You know, it's like, a, it's like once the suffering is there though, that your mind will want to run away from it. So you will want to distract yourself. I suffer because I overate, I suffer because I did something, and then you turn on the TV, you watch a movie, you go and call a friend, you spend time on Facebook, run away. And that's how you fail to recognize the suffering and you fail to make that connection that will help you to stop. Because you're not fully savoring the suffering, you're covering up with sweeping it under the carpet. So once you suffer, you know, rejoice in that suffering, like it's a good moment. It's like you have to treat it as a bitter ice cream. I don't know if you notice that I like ice cream. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's like a, you know, treat it like a really bitter ice cream. You have to eat it little by little and you have to finish it. And next time you will not ask for more, you know. 
I thought, it's like, if you go into an ice cream shop and you buy an, whatever, garlic flavor ice cream, you know? <laughs> you only buy it once. <laughs> you know? That's why, you know, the market for garlic ice cream is not very big. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Italian, sorry. <laughs> um, Anyways, I, I hope that is, that is clear enough. And I just one light, last thing that I want to add is that sometime to do this, you need time. Because if in your, in your lifestyle, you, you, you build this lifestyle that, that brings upon you these things, then it will be very difficult to fight it alone and to, to be just there by yourself. So sometimes you might need to, a long time. Like in Plum Village, we allow people to come here and to stay for three months or for one year, and it's a big engagement, you know, a lot of young people are doing that and they're sacrificing, you know, something to be able to come here. It's a big choice, but I, I respect that choice a lot because over one year we have the chance to see so many things in our mind. And this is a, an environment in which we will touch our habit energies, they will come up, but we have enough support to be able not to run away from it and not to sweep the suffering under the carpet. You will get the suffering, you will get your habit, and you really suffer about it. And then that will teach you that you, you might not want to do that again. Okay, so that's, you know, you might have to think of taking a long time to figure this out. And it's, it's good, it's a journey, you know, you're becoming friends with yourself and understanding yourself a little bit better. And I think it's nothing more important to, to do. So I hope this helps you. Thank you. Maybe we have a last last question. Dear Thai, dear Sangha, my question is about decision making. <laughs> I've been struggling a lot with it. Um, in the last year I have been trying to figure out um, what I want to do in the world, if I, what I'm going to study, what I'm going to do. And, um, but also small decisions like um, am I going to go to a place, am I going to buy something or even just now am I going to sit next to my friend or am I going to sit a little bit closer so I can get um, to the queue to ask a question. But um, um, I think there's a lot of fear and confusion and I have found myself sometimes um, just sitting in a place on my way to having to do something about a decision and um, not knowing what to do. So. having trouble deciding who's going to answer the question. <laughs> I 
think this uh, question may have something to do with living deeply and with our aspiration. So a little bit like in the previous answer, uh, sometimes we can look at our whole life as an experiment. This morning, I will be brave and I sit near the front to ask a question. And the next day you say, oh, today I won't push myself. I will enjoy not putting myself under pressure. And then the energy of mindfulness helps us live these different experiences deeply and then we get to understand something about ourselves each time. So it's good to experiment a lot, to go out of our comfort zone and then come back into our comfort zone. Uh, on my first trip here, when I was uh, almost 22 years old, I took the five mindfulness trainings. And uh, before that, I have to say, I, I didn't have a clear sense of direction and I was very bad at making decisions. Usually most of my decisions were based on what everyone around me thought I should do and what felt like the path of least resistance. And somehow in taking the mindfulness trainings, I found quite a cool path, which was a little bit of a radical path, <laughs> but empowered by the words of the trainings, I could tread that path, even though sometimes there was resistance in the people around me or in the options available. Um, so I remember, for example, how to decide whether to go to a party or not. The five mindfulness trainings helped me. <laughs> and uh, how to arrange a meeting with a friend instead of uh, going clubbing together. Uh, I chose to meet them in a park in the afternoon when there'd be no question about whether we'd drink alcohol or not. So I found ways to choose how to spend my time based on the insight of the five mindfulness trainings. And then that also led to a deeper sense of what was most important in my life. Um, there was a phrase that I read uh, at this, around the same time that was, uh, what will you do with your one precious life? And this question really stuck in my mind. How can I make every day count? How can I make every choice count? We don't know how long we have. Um, and I guess this circles back to the child's initial question right at the beginning. Why did we become monastics? And I think it's the same uh, reason why I wanted to follow the spiritual path of the five mindfulness trainings, because I wanted to um, do the right things and not the wrong things, uh, live in a way that would cause less harm live in a way that might help, uh, especially the planet and all the different species that are waiting for us to help them. And somehow um, uh, the practical dimension of the trainings helped me see uh, what can I do each day to live towards that aspiration. Um, and I realized it's not a question necessarily, I do this course, uh, like study, uh, or, or another one, or this job, or another job, but it's like, who would I like to be in the world with whoever um, I'm around? How would I like to listen to them? How would I like to take care of them? How would I like to consume? And uh, will this ha create more harm, or will this create more well-being? And somehow it's incredible the number of choices we make, we make each day. I think, uh, well, I don't know, maybe the biologist will tell us it's several thousand. But uh, maybe each day has one or two very clear choices that we have to make. And they are opportunities to build something beautiful with our life. And when we make a choice that the people around us are not sure about, <laughs> that's when we have to have this uh, listening ear towards our own heart. 
So we take time to look deeply and to listen to what's most important to us, to uh, give ourselves a chance to do what we know would be a good idea, and maybe even um, to choose the people we would like to check in with, the people we trust, the people we know understand us deeply, and we, we listen to those people. And, uh, and then whatever decision we make, it's not necessarily about the outcome of the decision, but it's about the way we decided and the way it felt to make that decision in the, in the moment we made it. We can't uh, predict the future, but we can create certain conditions in the present. And if we know that our present is made of generosity and courage and care and deep values, then we know we've got a good chance of building a beautiful future. Thank you, everyone, for um, for your supportive listening and your smiling faces. <laughs> and thank you for my dear sisters and brother for coming up here and sharing your heart, sharing your experiences. So um, we'll finish here with three sounds of the bell, and then we'll uh, enjoy walking meditation down to the beautiful garden of Shunha together. Have a wonderful day.